Hello and welcome to today's online intelligence briefing focusing on hypersonic weapons. My name is Andrew Gaylor and I'm the weapons team manager and I will moderate today's session. Just before I hand over to Rahul, I would like to highlight the information used to compile today's presentation has been drawn from a variety of Jane's content, but particularly Jane's Defence Equipment, Jane's Defence Weekly and Jane's International Defence Review. And so, on to the briefing, and I'll hand you over to Rahul Adoshi to start. This briefing is divided into five parts. Research and development of hypersonic technology has led to high-speed weapons uh, that in turn have been identified as a key area that militaries need to focus on to remain technologically relevant. For around two decades, developers were working towards primarily using hypersonic technology in a new class of weapon designs based on the ballistic missiles, boost glide vehicles, and cruise missile configurations. With the realization of matured technology, such as for the smart materials, re-entry vehicle dynamics, and wind tunnel testing, and availability of relevant subsystems, such as uh, propulsion units, navigation units, and miniaturized control units, uh, now, users' requirement and focus are shifting from uh, defensive missions to offensive roles. Recently, the US, Russia, and China all tested new hypersonic weapons, escalating a global competition for weaponry that can strike farther and harder than ever before and potentially defeat uh, existing defenses. We propose that there are currently three main categories of hypersonics research and development efforts that are ongoing in the U.S. And these uh, kind of uh, are approximately divided into the level of difficulty as well as when these technologies will be introduced operationally. In the initial track, which was first identified by Steve Trimble and Guy Norris at, of Aviation Week, they have suggested an initial track which is focused around that common glide vehicle, again, that simpler conical vehicle design. There are three programs in development that are expected to use this design. The Army's land-based hypersonic missile or long-range hypersonic weapon, the U.S. Navy's intermediate-range conventional prop strike, and it's also su suggested that the Air Force's hacksaw or hypersonic conventional strike weapon might also use this common glide vehicle as well although there is some debate about that. Next, it's important to note that the U.S. Army Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office released a description of the Army's first ever hypersonic equipped unit at a June 2019 Industry Day event. It showcased the joint services, common glide vehicle, and joint booster that form a common all-up round, which uses a, a transportable erector launcher, or TEL, which includes two missiles per tell. These will be based on an M870 trailer, which is then pulled by an M983A4 tractor, which is part of the heavy expanded mobility tactical truck family, which also currently pulls the, um, also currently pulls the Patriot and other uh, missile defense systems. The next stage of research is in more advanced hypersonic glide vehicles, as well as hypersonic cruise missiles. The next phase of hypersonic glide vehicles are likely based on vehicles that use a blended wing body design, which again offer a greater lift to drag ratio and range. These are likely to include the DARPA tactical boost glide, the Air Force's Aero or air launched rapid response weapon, which has also goes by the AGM 183A designation, as well as uh, in terms of hypersonic cruise missiles, the Air Force's hypersonic uh, air-launched air breathing weapons concept, or HAWK. Lockheed Martin has been awarded a significant majority of these systems, uh, or contracts for their development, including the Tactical Boost Glide, the Hacksaw, Aero, and HAWK, while Raytheon has also been awarded contracts for the HAWK as well. The third set of concepts are what we term emerging concepts, and they include the uh, advanced full-range engine, which is 
designed to power uh, reusable hypersonic vehicles, as well as longer range or uh, essentially globally range hypersonic glide vehicles. Longer range hypersonic glide vehicles are significantly more difficult to develop, especially if they're conventionally armed, than tactical range hypersonic glide vehicles because they must, must withstand the stress of higher speeds, higher heat, navigation and targeting challenges because of longer ranges, and because of longer times at high temps. The advanced full range engine is a turbine-based combined cycle engine that allows for the transition between high-speed turbine engines, which can operate at roughly Mach 2.3 to 2.5, as well as range engines uh, on the high end, which can operate down to about Mach 3.5. So the advanced full range engine program and TBCC engines in general are designed to link those two engine types together and achieve successful transition. And by doing so, they could allow a reusable hypersonic vehicle to start from sub Mach speeds and operate all the way up past hypersonic speeds above Mach 5. These engine designs are expected to factor into early designs that we've seen for concept vehicles such as Lockheed Martin's SR-72 and Boeing's Valkyrie uh, designs for reusable hypersonic vehicles. The funding for hypersonic weapons is set to grow significantly due to the increased interest in these weapons from countries like the U.S., which is trying to catch up with Russia and China. The United States is estimated to have spent over $3.3 billion for research and development of hypersonic weapons. Russia, which has advanced the most in hypersonic weapons programs, is estimated to have spent over $1.1 billion. This covers the avant-garde 3M22 Zircon and Kinzhal programs. Russian spend on hypersonic weapons is not expected to rise significantly as the Kinzhal is already in service, while the Zircon and avant-garde are close to entering the service. China funding for hypersonic weapons programs is assessed to be more than Russia. China is estimated to have spent over 1.5 billion on programs such as the DF-ZF and the Starry Sky 2. DF-ZF is expected to be operational by 2020, while Starry Sky would be operational by around 2020. To summarize, there's clearly two different approaches that have been taken to developing high-speed weapons comprising both glide vehicles and cruise missiles. Likewise, there are differing aspirations for their deployment from regional or global strategies. These have begun a new arms race with competing priorities for both offensive and defensive capabilities. This will also spill over into the air defence area as countries revisit their capabilities to try and address the emerging threats posed by hypersonic manoeuvring targets. However, whilst there is significant investment from various countries, the challenge of scaling the development to enable production remains a challenge. It's expected that these will be addressed in due course and there is now significant investment in the sector that will continue into the mid-term. Of course, an area that's not been mentioned for defence is directed energy weapons that may ultimately make all of these redundant if the technology can be made to work at a scale sufficient to defeat hypersonic weapons, but that will have to be a subject for a future briefing. Certainly there are still hurdles to be got over before many of these programmes are in full service, but the area will remain one to watch closely over the coming years.